let's turn to our scripture reading text. Genesis, the 11th chapter. In Genesis, the 11th chapter is recorded a unique event in the world's history, something that has not been true since. In verse 1, it says, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. I'd like us to look this morning at this idea of one language and one speech. What does it mean that the whole earth was of one language and of one speech? Are those terms synonymous? A mere repetition of terms. What is the significance in language and speech? Is there a difference? The word used to translate language literally signified a lip. The word in Hebrew used to designate a lip. And it's often translated a lip or language. The word for speech indicates literally a word and oftentimes is used to indicate the meaning of a word. So what it's saying is that the people on the earth at that time, they had not only one language, but their language had one meaning. When a word was spoken, there was universal understanding. And I'd like to look at this idea. Let's proceed to verse 6 of the same chapter. I'd like us to look at the result of this oneness of language among the people. They had one language and one word. In verse 6, it says, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. What was the result of their having one language and one speech? What did the Lord say? His first word was, Behold, the people is what? One. One in what way? Were they all one person, or were they one in unity in thought? They had one language, didn't they? Their words had one meaning. There was a unity of mind, and the unity of mind produced a unity of purpose. And therefore the Lord said, And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. A oneness of mind, a oneness of purpose, strengthened their cause. They were united in their effort. And it just so happens that this effort that we're reading about here in Genesis chapter 11 was a design to rebel against God. Even in this, the Lord said, nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. They would succeed in their purpose because their language was one and their speech was one. They were one people. They were united in their goal and in their purpose and they would succeed. Their design was to build a kingdom a universal kingdom. And Babel was to be the capital of that kingdom. And God saw that unless he intervened, their purpose would be accomplished. And I would like us to take this idea and to apply it to the Christian camp. Can it be said of us, brethren, that our language is one and our speech is one? Can God look down upon us and say, this people is one? And behold, nothing will be restrained from them which they imagine to do. Is that God's desire? And does not God want us to have one language and one speech? I believe it is. And there is only one way, brethren, that I know to attain that one language and one speech. The language that these men learned here at the Tower of Babel was given to them. It was something that they learned, just as every child learns its language. And the meaning of the words, these are things that they learn from childhood. And these men learned their language from their fathers, their parents. And because that language was one, they received the same language and the same meanings to their words. And so it's to be with us as Christians. We are to adopt the language of our Father. Our language is to be one with heaven in language and in word and in meaning. This is the only way that we, like the people at the Tower of Babel, will unite. Turn with me to Second Timothy and chapter 3. Here the Apostle Paul admonishes Timothy. He says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And oftentimes we stop there. And we use this as a means of proving that all the scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, is inspired by God. But Paul goes on and says that this word has a purpose. He says it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. For all these purposes, the word of God is profitable And this is God's admonishment to us. All scripture, brethren, is given by inspiration of God, and it is the only book, truly, 
that is profitable in these areas. It is the only book that is truly profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And until we as a people adopt this book as our own, we will remain with the division of the confusion of tongues among us. God gave to his people a means of breaking down that barrier of the confusion of tongues. There is still one language to us as Christians. There is still one speech. And when we adopt that language and that speech as our own, and each of us adopts this language and speech as his own, then it can truly be said that the people is one. They have one language, and they have one speech. I'd like to note some comments that the Apostle Paul makes in the book of 1 Corinthians. It's in chapter 1, Paul's introduction. Paul beseeches his brethren of Corinth, and he says in verse 10 of chapter 1, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. This was the Apostle Paul's desire for the Corinthians. It was his earnest desire. And it was so much so that it called forth this epistle from the Apostle to the believers in Corinth. And verse 11 he says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. There are contentions among the believers. Contentions over what? Turn with me, please, to chapter 14 of the same book. I'd like us to read verse 26. Paul asks them a question. He says, How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. So what was the cause of their contentions? Simply put, every man had his own language. Every man had his own doctrine. Every man had his own psalm, his own interpretation. They were not united in mind, in language, in his speech. And herein, I believe, lies our great fault as a people. We, like the Corinthians, were divided in mind and were divided in opinion. And to a great extent, we have not adopted the Word of God as our own, with its definitions, with its words, and with its language. And so every man hath his own doctrine, his own interpretation. And when he reads the Bible, he interprets it this way or that way, or whatever way he chooses. And so there's contention among us. Turn with me to the book of Psalms. I'd like to read a couple verses from the second division of Psalm 119, starting at verse 9. The psalmist asks a question. He says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? And he gives the answer to his question. He says, By taking heed thereto, according to thy word. You know, we often have heard the subject of Bible sanctification, of being sanctified, made clean, in other words. The psalmist here tells us by what means we are to be sanctified. 